gentlemen, welcome back to the Alpha M Podcast. And today I have some a sentimental personal friend and favorite of mine. Carl Morawski, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing excellent. How about yourself? I'm well. So I need to give a little backstory and context to why you touch me so much and why I've, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you over the years. Um, you know, you have come into sort of the fold of, you know, the, the menfluential, you know, YouTube world. Um, I believe it was what, like four years ago or five years ago. I believe you started your YouTube channel back in, it was like in December, like the last week of, of 2015. And so yeah. it's been about four years, right? Now, did you mm -hmm. come to the StyleCon back then prior to starting the channel? I believe you did, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. That was the impetus was for starting it. And it was like, um, you know, anybody who's never been, you leave and, and it's just this, uh, it's this feeling you want to continue. You know, you want, you get totally inspired. You go home, you're ready to take on the world. And I think a lot of times that's, that tends to like taper off for a lot of people. You forget how that felt and you, you, you kind of forget. Absolutely. It time. Let's back up a second, Carl. <laughs> you like how do I even describe you? You are a you know salt of the earth, blue collar guy, self self professed blue collar dude, right? Yep. You live up in the Northeast, you know New England. Um, you work on the railroad. I mean, come on, does it get any more blue collar than that, right? <laughs> salt of the earth, and and the way that you have sort of parlayed your passions into sort of a a, a career and and this new sort of like frontier for you. I just find it really inspiring. And I think that a lot of our listeners will find it's truly like just amazing, sort of that, that journey that you sort of have gone on. Because I think a lot of people out there ha always have sort of the, the idea that, you know what, I would love to be an entrepreneur. I would love to do this. I love clothes. I love whatever it may be. But they never take that leap. They never take that step. Well, about five years ago, you took that step to sort of scratch the itch of style. And where it has led you in terms of sort of, you know, everything from, you know, your video and then you started making videos and it's like, oh my God, I love making videos and I want to up my video production. And then it became about that. And then it was like, oh my God, I love boots. And now you probably have 6,000 pair of boots. And then <laughs> you started a membership website to help other guys sort of realize sort of their, their own personal potential. And so I think, you know, you're, you're mid evolution. You know, a lot of the people that, that I know sort of have, have, have made that jump, have made that sort of transition from thinking about it to full time doing what they love, what they're passionate about. You are mid transition, the way that I sort of see it. Tell everybody a little bit about your story, where you come from, what you do, why you started doing the YouTube thing, and then the evolution <laughs> of that. And, and I like, it's fascinating. And so I talk too much. I'm going to let you do a little bit of work. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, how I mean, was that really... for an intro? That, that was probably the worst intro ever, right? Or it was the best. I'm not sure which one. No, not at all. You know, it, it's funny because it, I, I was watching your videos long ago, you know, back in what, 2013, 2014. And then I, I saw the first style con come and go. And I was like, man, I really want to go to that. I couldn't justify it at the time. You know, I, it, I hadn't, it wasn't even on my radar to make it a, a career or even get into it at all. The next year, I started toying around with the idea and I remember specifically going on on my honeymoon my, with my wife and I was sitting in this little cabana outside in Mexico and I was like, I shouldn't be this bummed to go back to work. Like I was dreading it. I was counting down the days. And I'm like, God, it's Wednesday. I only have, you know, a few more days left. I got to really soak it in and you can't relax when you feel that way. So I was like, all right, well, you know what? I I'm going to go to this and I'm just going to at least meet some other people who are into the same kind of thing that I am. And it was this electric feel in the air, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's just, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's so alluring and intoxicating. It's, it's really unbelievable. So I remember sitting there and I'm watching Antonio talk and, and I'm thinking, uh, what the hell do I have to bring to the table? Everybody else here has their niche, you know, Brock is up there and he's doing the modest man thing and everybody has their, their, their gig. And what I didn't realize at the time is it took them a long time to really chisel that out of, it, it didn't, I'm looking at their chapter 10 and I'm comparing it yes. to my, you know, table of contents. Right, and right. Uh, so I'm ever thinking like, what could I do? What could I do? I, here I am, I'm an electrician. I, you know, how do I dovetail that? The guys who I work with aren't into style at all. How can I just make this work? Um, so I just began 
and just started. And I found that there's so much value in imperfect action, just starting and then kind of figuring it out. You know, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You know, you're going to look back and you're going to cringe on those early days. But if you never start, then you can never get to chapter one and chapter two and begin that journey down that path. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. We're just going to start. And I look back and I'm like, oh, geez, you know, like we all do. Like, what was I thinking or whatever, you know, or production wise. Well, you start, like, but you started uh, originally, I think you were going to try and be like an image consultant, right? Like yeah, that was yeah. kind of the goal. It wasn't necessarily YouTube. That was going to be sort of like a, a mechanism, but it was to be um, an image consultant, right? Absolutely. And yeah. so talk a little bit about your background, though. You had mentioned that you're an electrician, but now you work for the railroad, correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it's the two are, are the same. You're also you a know? musician. You're not yeah. also a musician, a drummer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you yeah. Your dad and I drummer. had a lot of good yeah, you are a true renaissance man. And so what is your background? How did you like, how do you go from electrician to the railroad to drumming oh. to style consultant? Yeah, I, it seems really strange. I think a lot of it just, um, you, you know, I can kind of trace it back to when, when I got out of high school and I was this sure. one guy in high school, you know, left high school. Who were you in high school, Carl? Who were you in high school? I was I was the drummer band metal nerd guy. You know, it, that was what it. I did. I was the guy who played drums. And I've been doing that since I was 13. I realized, though, when I got out of high school that that wasn't getting me what I wanted. You know, specifically, like I wasn't the most popular guy with the ladies at all because I, I was just like, now I shave my head because there's not much left up there. Back in the day, I was shaving my head because I was like, I'm going to try to be the most intimidating guy I possibly can be. And women don't really respond to that suit too much, you know? <laughs> so, no, no. <laughs> I got out of high school and I remember thinking, all right, what I'm doing now isn't getting me what I want. It's not making me what I want. I'm miserable. I have a chance now that I'm, I'm, I'm away from my normal crowd to be somebody completely different or be who I want to be or at least start making steps toward that. And so that's what I did. I was like, I'll grow my hair out. I'll start going to the gym. Um, I'll start paying attention to what I wear rather than just another Metallica or whatever shirt. And uh, it was this whole transformation and it was an amazing experience. So I remember thinking, well, style was just such a big part of that and trying to help other guys realize that potential. And I had very limited success uh, as a style consultant. In the beginning, you know, it was through like targeted Facebook ads around my area and stuff like that. And um, there are some guys who are willing to, to pay for that service, but ultimately it just, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. So, it's a grind. Um, it's a grind. And it it's is. also not scalable. And that was something that I, I, I faced when I was doing the, the style consulting is that it's, you know, you're, it's a lot of time you're working, you know, a long, long day, long hours, and you're making good money, but the, the clients are, are few and far between. And, um, you know, and so it, it, it's, it's a tough grind. And so yeah. what was the next step for you? At that time, I was, an, I was a mechanic. I got out of high school. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. All right. Okay. So add another one. Got it. Okay. Yeah. When I got out of high school, uh, I got into the, the college that I wanted to get into, but you know, my parents were split up and it was more or less like, look, going to New York for college just isn't in the cards financially. Um, and looking back, I'm glad I didn't because it was in the music industry and that has completely changed since those days. You know, I would probably be homeless. So, you know, I, I just was looking for a job that I could do. And I always enjoyed working on cars. So I got a job at the local auto shop. I worked there for a while until I realized that I am at the peak here. I've peaked and I'm 22 years old. Like, this is not acceptable. I'm looking at the other guys who I'm working with who are 50. They're doing the exact same job I'm doing for not much more money. So I'm thinking to myself, well, what can I do? I don't have a college education. I don't have any connections. I'm not from, you know, anybody who's, you know, like a rich family with any sort of, you know, privileges and in, in getting into a company, none of that. So one day I was just really pissed off at work and I got in my truck and I drove to like the local tech school. And that night I signed up to be an electrician. I decided on the way there that I wanted to do electrical because I remember thinking, well, plumbing's <laughs> kind of, yeah, plumbing's kind of like- Kind of shitty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's shitty work, Carl. Exactly. I'm like, like, but electricians, you know, they're always kind of respected and it looks like it's, you know, it could be, be something I'm into. Set off down that path. Um, now I work for one of the biggest contractors in New England, and one of the big things that we do is work on catenary and third rail work coming out of Grand Central and up through to Connecticut and Stanford and stuff. There's a lot of it. 
But it sounds funny when you talk to people who don't live in an area where their rail is very popular. It sounds like you're working like <laughs> with like, like coveralls you, on, with like a yeah, pickaxe you, over you, your shoulder. You, you've got a hammer and you're you're driving stakes <laughs> into the into the railroad ties, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. But it, interestingly enough, the content that you started to create was was based on your passion. But you you joked about you know coveralls, but a lot of the material that you're putting out there is about workwear. It is about the rugged boots. It's about Carhartt clothing. It's about leather jackets. Talk a little bit about why you were so passionate about this genre of, of clothing and, and sort of workwear. Mm, there's a tremendously underserved guy who, who is in the world of, of work. And my, I think what I've discovered is that these guys don't really want to tell you that they're into the way they look at all. You know, it's, it's something that most guys won't admit among the company of their, their peers at work. But there's plenty of people who actually do. And so I found that whether it's just looking for the best thing to work in, you know, best work pants, boots, whatever it is, or a way to kind of take that look and when you leave work, not become somebody completely different. You know, we're, I, I still want to leave and I still want to look like a rugged guy who, you know, works with his hands for a living. But I want to take that and make it look refined. And that's exactly what I was doing. I just kind of thought I was the only one and come to find out that's not true at all. So how did you get into, like I went back and I actually watched some of your earlier videos. Was the Anson Belt review, was that your first video? Or yeah, was, was the that first video. You, the first video, which is better than like the first 300 videos that I did. <laughs> um, you know, and it was, and, and you just had a, a demeanor and a very calm, you know, sort of, sort of air about you. And then you combine it with that, that buttery soft voice and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's all she wrote, right? So, so what I wanna talk about now is you have taken your YouTube sort of career and, and, and you've really doubled down on the production value of the content that you're creating. I mean, it's like next level, like, you know, how did you, was this always a passion or just something that you sort of discovered that you were really good at and, and you loved doing it? Yeah, I just, I figured it out over time. You know, it was, uh, it was definitely something where the bug bit me and I did not expect that anywhere. And that's the same thing with, you know, just starting something. Who knew that that would be a passion, but it really did take hold. And all of a sudden, you know, you're fiddling around and it's like, I can walk you through the evolution of color grading and lighting setups and all that kind of thing. And always trying to perfect it, which is probably why the first 200 videos all look different because I'm messing around with something new. I wish I could have just been like, this is my setup. Now let's concentrate on the content. But um, no. So, and so it, something it, else that you've evolved. done that I love, um, you go into the factories, you go and talk to the craftsmen, the artisans and, and do almost like a, like a, a, a documentary of sorts. What has been your favorite video that you have made in that genre? Ooh, yeah, that's a tough one. I really liked, I went to a place called American Woolen, and it was a guy from Italy. He was a uh, Woman? An investment. American, what is it? Woolen, American Woolen. Woolen, okay. Yeah. What is so that? it was a guy, he was an investment banker from Italy, and he came over to Connecticut, of all places. I didn't realize this was right in my backyard. And he took over an old, shut-down Loro Piani factory with, like, six buildings, their own water source, the, the works and hired back the staff that had gotten laid off in the, in, the, in the town, put them all back to work, and now they're making um, textiles for Allen Edmonds and Timberland and all these huge names. And he's really changed that town just by wow. creating jobs there again. And it was just amazing to walk around there. And this guy is like high energy. I was chasing him around, trying to get like steady shots. And I'm like, can you just wait a minute? You know, I'm trying to like get a shot of something. Yeah, yeah. And he just wouldn't, he wouldn't stop. He was just go, 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 go. But it was really cool. And his passion for that was just, it was, it was so infectious. It was great. Speaking of passion, one of yours is boots. Big yeah. passion, right? <laughs> and so I, oh, yeah. I think you have like 15, 20 videos about, <laughs> about boots. I'm not sure exactly how much. How much money have you spent on boots? Have you tallied it? Have uh, you figured it out? I'm afraid Some to. of them are expensive. Yeah, yeah. right? Thousands yeah, and thousands of dollars on boots. What yeah. is it about the boot that really resonates with you? Uh, I'll tell you honest, for me, I'd like to be able to throw on the right, or the, the first pair of shoes that I put on in the morning and be able to do whatever I'm going to do. So if I'm going to go out and I'm going to ride on my motorcycle, or if I'm going to go out to coffee with a friend, or if I'm going to take the kids to the park, 
I want to be able to do all those things in the same footwear. I don't want to be too fussy about what I wear, you know? So it was, it was really part of that. I want to be able to do all these things and not be like, I got to stop back and I got to change because these, these won't work or whatever. Nah, I want to be able to just, just hammer down. All right. Well, talk to me a little bit about how you were trying to impact other men. Um, I did not know until I really started looking around and, and really catching back up with what you're doing that you started a, a membership website, right? Mm -hmm. Where you are trying to help other guys sort of realize a few, you know, just basically be the best version of themselves that we possibly can, right? You hear that a lot though. You hear, oh, you want to be the best version of yourself. Well, you have a different sort of mantra or sort of the three pillars of sort of the community that you're building. Um, one is, what is it, a rugged mindset, if I'm correct. Yeah. Is that accurate? Okay, yeah. tell me a little bit about what is this rugged mindset? <laughs> I'm uh, serious. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was um, it was sort of a reaction to what the other things that I've seen out there. There's a lot of guys who come out with this very machismo kind of military approach. That always turned me way off. Automatically, I was like, eh, this ain't for me. But at the same time, I always respected the guy who was like the quiet, tough, guy you would call on if something went wrong you know all of a sudden you have an issue at your house you know the the plumbing's leaking downstairs or your car breaks down who's the guy that you call and i was kind of the figured, guy with the that's, truck that's <laughs> the it. guy who has the truck right <laughs> that's it that's it it's the guy who keeps cool under pressure the guy who can go through things and i i, I just came up with that that idea is when i was thinking about the word rugged itself which means that you know you can be put through your it's paint your paces you can endure hardship and come out on the other end better for it. So you can go up against adversity and not have any, and so you can extend that out through so many different things. No matter what you're going through, you can endure it. You know, we just had that power outage. We had to delay this a week because we were mm -hmm. out of power for uh, four or five days. Well, you're an electrician, Carl, how did this not happen <laughs> faster? Oh, we had a generator. You're the guy I'm you know? calling. You're the only electrician I know. If, that, if my power goes out or I need to replace a, an outlet, you're the guy, Carl. Just so you know, you're my guy. Yeah, but I can't create electricity. That's the only problem. But um, All right. You know, just being able to take care of things. What about boss style? What does that mean? A huge part of, you know, gaining traction in my career, whether it was going from an apprentice to a journeyman, a journeyman is somebody who's licensed, to a foreman who actually runs crews of guys, to now getting into the office, was based on the fact that I always dressed one level above where I was at. So when I was an apprentice, everybody else was running around in ratty jeans, uh, you know, didn't shave. I mean, you know, I got a full beard and stuff, but you know, they didn't take care of their grooming. They looked like, you know, like I that. changed, yeah. I changed that by wearing a polo, making sure everything I wore was clean, making sure that I was groomed, making, you know, and so what ended up happening was I really kind of pissed off our foreman at the time because people would come onto the job and they would think that I'm in charge mm -hmm. and I'm not in charge, but they would come over and they'd see the guy who looked clean, who looked like he was put together and they'd come over and start asking me questions. And he's like, no, 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 he's just an apprentice. That eventually <laughs> got the, uh, the attention of my boss. And he was like, you know, you might not be a bad face of the company at, at meetings move that up I, I ended up climbing the ranks um now i'm in the management side and and every i can i can not totally attribute it to that completely but it did give me that extra maybe 10 percent and when it's you versus another person in the same job 10 percent might be all you need so um, absolutely that's that's the idea behind that what about the th and i love that i love that i didn't know i i thought like boss oh just be the boss or but like literally like dress like your boss yeah, <laughs> and and exactly i, I absolutely I absolutely love that because it is true. I mean, you know, we live in such an incredibly competitive world. You know, we're competing all the time. We're competing for, you know, for, for money, for career, for job, for, you know, for significant others. We are always competing. And that's something that I sort of really hammered home when I was doing the image consulting is you cannot afford to not put your best foot forward because if you're not doing it, your competition might. If you put two people in the same room, same qualifications, everything is equal. One person takes care of themselves in terms of their style, their grooming, their presentation. The other person does, doesn't. A hundred percent of the time, the dude who does and has the nice clothes, the, 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 the presentation a little bit more polished, he's the guy who gets the job, gets the girl, gets the money, gets the whatever it is. And so um, I 100% agree with you um, on, that, on that point. The third 
component to your sort of pillars or mantra is all about being a grounded leader. What do you mean by that? The guy who's calm when things are going wrong, that's the person who people tend to look to for advice. So today, for example, we are doing a huge, huge job, $33 million job. We're plowing into the ground um, these cables, right? We had a run today that was over 6,000 feet from one end to the other. We're shutting down roads. We're doing all kinds of stuff. In the middle of this thing, we hit a stone, blew out a shear pin, damaged the cable. This is the only cable that we have that we ordered in this specific length. It'll take a long time to get. Um, huge, huge problem. People are panicking all over the place, but the person that everybody looks at is the guy who is calm under fire because he's the one who's going to make the decision ultimately. And nobody ever, no, people don't tend to value the person who panics. And I've always noticed that the person who can keep their shit together is the one who, who people tend to, to gravitate toward. It takes confidence to do that. But um, being that, whether it's for your friends or for your family, being that person that people know they can go to when they have a real, mm -hmm. real problem um, is so valuable. And it's partly is just being that guy, becoming that guy, the person I've always um, No, admired. I love it. I love it. So what's next for you, Carl? You've sort of, you, like I, I consider you sort of mid- journey. What's next? What is the next, you know, one year, two year, five year, whatever it may be, what does it look like for you? And what do you, I, I should say, what would you like it to look like? Yeah, yeah, ideally. Uh, I'll tell you, honestly, what I want to do this next year is I want to start finding other people who do, who are in the trades, who do different jobs, the carpenters, the guys who do these jobs, maybe never heard of, crane operators. Um, I really want to go and interview them, get an idea of what they do to provide sort of a library of jobs that people can look at. If you're 17, 18 years old, and you're going, college just ain't for me. I want to do something else. Well, asking these people, hey, so, you know, what's the range of earning potential in this job? Some of these guys, the guys I work with, they all earn over six figures. Easy. Nobody knew that that was a possibility. I didn't. I think there, I think I think Mike Rowe and Dirty Jobs really. I mean that that goes down as one of my favorite shows of all time, and I think what he did really well is just show and and he still talks about the fact that a lot of these jobs that are not glamorous that we need as a society in order to keep our society rolling. You know these guys that are doing this work, you know, it might not be glamorous. They might smell like shit by the at the end of the day. You know, but they're millionaires. You know, they're 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 they've got these amazing mm -hmm. businesses, and they've sort of they've they've hollowed out a niche. And so I love that idea that you're going to be interviewing these people. What else? What else do you think you you'll be doing? I really want to develop a product of some sort. I'm still figuring out what that looks like. I really like working with individual makers, although that's really hard to scale. Um, but I've started to do a couple collaborations with people who I've who they have the goods, they make the stuff, and they're amazing at it but they suck at marketing. Well, I can help them on that side because the people who watch my channel are really into that type of thing. So if we make a product together that's really great, then we could probably sell a number of units of it. I would like to be able to do that time and time again and find these different artisans who are really good at what they do. I, there's a guy, he works out of an Airstream trailer in Kentucky, I think it is, hand making boots one at a time. Well, two at a time. <laughs> you know, I mean, a guy like that. And he's not spending time on uh, marketing at yeah. all. But if I can get him out there to, to people who are really interested, I would like to do perfect, more perfect of stuff Perfect example. Like that. All right, this belt that I'm wearing, it is not an Anson. I'm going to show it to you. It's a double, double ring you know, belt, right? I, uh, I love double ring belts for whatever reason. And so I was online and I was looking, and they were really hard to find. There, none of the you know, real manufacturers made what I was looking for. And what I ended up stumbling upon was this, this guy who was retired who basically makes these makes belts. He makes, you know, different kinds of belts. You can do the double ring, you can do, you know, a few other options. And it is the most archaic website. It's like, hey, mail me a letter with your size and, and measure it like this. And it just like I, I loved it so much. And I just thought to myself, you know, this guy, he's retired, he's doing this. You know, I think the belt cost me like 50 bucks or something like that. And um, you know, he got back to me after I emailed him. And um, you know, just thinking about if he really wanted to turn that into a business, what the potential could actually be in the age of the internet with a marketing channel or outlet. Um, and so you are, are thinking about, you know, finding these craftsmen, these artisans 
and helping them sort of sort of I guess like when I when I hear you say this I almost picture like this like this website right where it's you know just different things that are cool that you can go to you know you've got this list of of products that you know are sort of personally curated by you that you know have you vouched for you've tested that you love and allowing other people to sort of you know go and and you know, you act as sort of like the conduit between it, making a commission or maybe an upcharge, and they do the work, they do the drop shipping. Um, is that sort of what I what I hear you saying? Yeah, I love yeah, it. yeah, exactly. Because I I sniff these places out. I've always liked to do that kind of thing, and uh, it's amazing the guys that you can find or girls who are just they're they're holed up in their workshop, and you really have to dig to find them. But you can find some really amazing stuff out there. And so it's great because a lot of people ask me and they like I'm a resource for them to find the best whatever it is in my genre. And usually you got to go and you got to go knock on this guy's door, like you said, and ask him to make you a bag or a belt or whatever it is. So let's talk a little bit about about money in terms of, of being a content creator and, and making it, you know, in a world of, you know, people like me who does basically a lot of promotions you know working with different brands when was it how soon after you started your youtube channel did you actually make any money and how much was it and what was it for uh it was well are you talking aside from adsense revenue yeah, yeah, yeah. aside from adsense revenue yeah um it was probably a, you know some affiliate uh money you know that that's that's a good way to do it and it's becoming more and more popular, but I, I, I don't remember exactly how much it was, but I was part of a few of the, the earlier affiliate marketing things. And I was like, oh, wow, you can actually make more here than you can with the AdSense, which yeah, no, isn't no, no. much. You need, a, you need a lot of views you need. And that's, I think, one of the, the big misconceptions is just because you have YouTube videos, you're not making you know, a lot of money from the AdSense. But in terms of you decided not to do sort of the, the as many brand deals, and, and paid promotions because you, I'm assuming, wanted to really maintain your credibility and do what you love in terms of, of the content that you create. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, and that's the, that's one of the pitfalls, I think. You see a lot of people who, they go all in. They go, that's it, this is what I'm doing. Well, unfortunately, those bills keep coming. And so I have the luxury of doing that because I have a full-time job. I can turn down whatever I want. But I can understand the appeal of, well, we'll offer you five, ten thousand dollars to do this particular video. You have bills, and you're looking at how am I going to make this work. I, I sympathize with guys like that, and it's only because I have that full time gig, or to diversify enough that you can turn those kind of things down. So, talk to us about somebody's out there. They want to start a YouTube channel. What's your best two tips in terms of of getting started? Because you had mentioned earlier, you know, looking back and seeing and cringing and being like, oh my God, what was I talking about? What was I doing, right? It is, <laughs> it's horrible looking back. But what are your two best tips for somebody who's thinking about possibly getting into sort of the YouTube space and, and creating content? Hmm. The first thing is that your audio is more important than video. You know, who would have thought that in video, your most important thing is, is audio? It sounds counterintuitive, but people will watch a crappy video with decent audio rather than the other way around. So if you're gonna spend money, most people have a limited budget to spend, spend it on a decent mic and, uh, and audio first. So as far as production goes, that's the number one thing. Other than that though, um, try. I see too many people who try to copy, I've seen people who copy your formula to the T and they burn out because it's not authentic to them and people aren't watching because they can tell it's inauthentic. So it sounds so cliche to say, find your authentic voice, but ultimately we all end up there anyway. I began somewhere where I thought I wanted to end up, ended up where I actually was more in my headspace. Whether you do it the long, hard way, the way I did, or if you just start in the beginning saying, this is what I'm into, this is who I am, this is what I value, um, you have to be authentic because people sniff that out. People have a sixth sense for inauthenticity. No, a hundred percent. And that's something that I, I talk about often is, is when I started YouTube, it was, it was very early. It was 2008. And I was looking around at the people that were popular, the people that were getting views. And back then there, there, it was, it was very un PC. And so a lot of the things that were getting attention were people being sort of over the top were being very crude. Um, you know, saying things that were a little bit outlandish. And I thought that that's what I needed to do in order to basically get approval and get views and to be liked. And so 
I started, you know, making videos and being, you know, honestly, like kind of a dick. And um, and looking back, those videos, for the most part, are gone because I was so embarrassed of it. But everything changed for me when I sort of dropped the act and dropped the shit and just sort of got authentic and real and and you know, hey, this is me. I've got flaws. I'm, I'm you know, I'm obviously not perfect. And um, and I'm going to be vulnerable. And so I think that for me, um, the thing that has really helped me sort of with my longevity is just being vulnerable and allowing people to sort of come into your world and, and share, you know, sort of what you're going through with you when you're going through a tough time or when you're when you're happy, when you're excited. Um, I think, you know, there there is a I think social media is is a double edged sword, right? It's there's a lot of great things about it. But I look around at sort of the state of, of you know, sort of social media, and it's, it's incredibly toxic. Um, you know, you had mentioned earlier that sort of a turnoff for you was this like over the top machismo, sort of, you know, beat your chest, I am so macho and manly. And I gotta be honest, Carl, that, is, that turns me off so much. There are people that we know that sort of have gone that really hardcore you know, I'm not saying right wing or left wing, but they're just so over the top with, you know, being the man and being a man and a man, 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 man. How do you balance it in today's world? How do you be a man, you know, but a Renaissance man? Like, what, what would you say is a characteristic or what should you try to do or strive for as a man um, that's sort of like a, a balance. I don't even, even know if there's a question in this, but what maybe what's yeah. your take on 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 sort of the state of of uh, masculinity, maybe. Maybe yeah. that's a, a better... I, you know what? I think we all have an in, a very good internal barometer for these things. You know, if you think that you should hold the door for somebody, hold the door. Go with your first instinct. When you start overthinking things, you know, I'm reading so much stuff about how to raise my kids and ways that we shouldn't. And, and no, you know, we actually know more than we give ourselves credit for that that instinct to do different things is usually right you know if you think it's a good idea to pull over and help somebody because they have a a, a tire that's you know flat whatever it, this situation might be just do it just go with your main instinct don't worry about pc bs be a gentleman about it and and that's always led me down the right path try to be helpful try to be as kind as you can kindness has never ever led anywhere wrong for me ever so a lot of times, if you just stick to the same core principles, then you're okay. It's when you start to try to amplify that sort of masculinity that it's it's it goes off the rails, you know. And we're wonderfully different, you know. My wife and I are so different, and you have to celebrate those differences. There's a good thing. Masculinity can be good, can be a great thing, and I don't like the idea of thinking we're all the same or we have to be more like that or they have to be more like this. Unfortunately, it's become a four letter word, you know, and. And you're right. It's t it's tough because you really have to tread a fine line between getting political with it when, and not. I, I agree, and and you know that's one of the the one of the comments that I see on my videos often is, um, you know, like oh, you know, I I my the name of my channel is Alpha M, right? Alpha male, and um, you know, even though the backstory to that was, it's not that I ever thought that I was the you know the biggest or the toughest or the picture of you know masculinity, um, and so. You know, the backstory to that was when I was starting my image consulting business, I needed to come up with like a name for, you know, this, this a, an image consulting firm that was specializing in men. And so I'm like, oh, king of the jungle, nah, a little too much. You know, so I'm thinking of all these things and I thought alpha male, eh, it kind of felt a little bit too like over the top. And so, you know, M was a little bit more stylized of an option. But, you know, people very frequently point out that I am not like the most, you know, classically like masculine dude. But I really feel like in today's world, you know, you need a different skill set. You know, back in the day, you know, our grandfathers, it was the biggest, it was the strongest, it was, you know, the tallest, it was the, it was, these were the people that were viewed as like the alpha male. I feel like in today's world, the alpha male has evolved a bit. Yes, you know, you, you should exercise and be strong, strong physically, along with, you know, mentally and emotionally. But I really truly feel like, like there is a, there is a hybrid. Um, and when I talk about, you being a renaissance man, I really feel like even though you are this like macho sort of, you've got this very masculine, you know, macho presence, you're a very sensitive dude. And, and I just, I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're a sweetheart. 
And, um, <laughs> you know, you, I mean, seriously, you're a sweetheart, Carl. And, um, you know, just very, and, and, and so I just, I love that about you. And the fact that, you know, you have for, for the audience out there, um, Carl and my father uh, met at the, at the conference, the Menifluential Conference. And being both musicians, my dad is also in the drumming, hand drumming. And, um, you know, you and he have just really hit it off. And um, you have been such a nice guy and, and a great friend to him. And, and I know that he has really appreciated your friendship. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing just to see sort of the, the trickle down effect of, you know, this random conference that Antonio and I put on thinking that we would get some of our stylish buddies together to talk shop because we really didn't have you know, a, a network or anything, and, and, and being an entrepreneur is, is a very lonely road oftentimes. Just to see some of the relationships and the lives that have been changed, and you being one of those people that has truly changed my life along with my father's life. And so I just want to thank you so much for just being just a, 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 a rock in sort of, when I think about people that, you know, I would go to if I ever had a problem, even though we don't talk all the time, we're not always in communication, like I view you as one of those people. And there aren't that many of them. And so I just want to thank you for always being just, you know, a solid guy and, and doing what you say you're going to do and, and always being a gentleman about it. And so I just want to thank you so much, Carl, for everything that you've done for me, everything you've done for the, the thousands and thousands of guys out there. Um, you know, you've really changed a lot of lives. Well, I really appreciate that, man. And you got to realize how surreal it is for me going from the guy who was in bed <laughs> With my iPad watching videos of you and being like, man, maybe I should go to this thing and this 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 incredible trip, which began a journey that, uh, I mean, it's just it's an amazing thing, you know. When you go it's down to the people that yeah, and the people mm -hmm. that you meet, I can honestly say that if you weren't there, that this wouldn't have happened at all. It would have been something yeah. different, possibly, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. have come down. I wouldn't have gone down this road. I wouldn't have gone to that conference. I wouldn't have been energized and so inspired to begin this. And uh, and all through it, you've always been very generous with your time. And, and hey, Aaron, can we catch up? And we have like an hour long conversation about ridiculous stuff, you know, and it's just like it's so crazy to me. It's it's, it's to me. It was almost like, uh, you know, oh, boy. Yeah, I really like watching Tom Cruise in this movie. And now Tom Cruise is like your buddy calling you up and being like, dude, COVID's crazy, right? I mean, exactly. it's just, it's an amazing thing. And I really, really value our friendship a lot. Well, listen, Carl, where can everybody find you? Uh, CarlMurowski.com. That's with Carl with a C last name, M-U-R-A-W-S-K-I. Search the same thing on YouTube. I'm there. Same thing on Instagram. I've tried to keep it all homogenous and uh, the same name. And uh, way back in the day, it was New England Style Consulting, which I realized I had a hard time saying. I'm like, screw it. I'm It was like 5,000 subscribers. <laughs> I got to just change this. I can't keep saying this, man. You know, so uh, just change it to my name. And um, if you search that in any of the platforms except for uh, Twitter, I'm, I'm there. It's super clean. Carl, thank you so much. Guys, we'll link to everything down below. Carl, you're an angel and a gentleman. Thanks, brother, and good luck. If you need anything, let me know. Thanks, buddy.